tonight, violent scenes at Lamport Stadium. That was pretty intense. Um, I was scared for a lot of people. Dozens of arrests as police and security moved in to forcibly remove those living in an encampment there. Plus, a grim scene in the city's northwest after two people are found dead inside a home with obvious signs of trauma. And really excited to just see, feel the, the thunder in the stadium and the excitement. The Toronto FC are back home again at BMO Field, and so are the fans. Nearly 15,000 of them will bring you all the excitement. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon, and that is where we begin tonight. It's a night many Toronto FC fans have been waiting for. The team welcomed nearly 15,000 fans to their game tonight. That's more than double the attendance of their last match at BMO Field, on Saturday. Adele Minokduk joins us live from Liberty Village where it's uh, pretty hopping. Adele, the large crowd isn't just impacting the game but uh, the surrounding businesses as well. Yeah, that's right, Kelda. Just take a look behind me at the patio here at local public eatery, not an empty seat inside. And if you go around the other side and you look inside the restaurant, again, they're at full capacity indoors. So we know that on Saturday they had 7,000 fans at the game. It was a mixture of first responders and season ticket holders who won a lottery draw. But tonight, more fans got the opportunity to see the Reds take the pitch. Now, TFC did not announce the official attendance for the game, but we know that around 5.30, they stopped taking walks and so obviously a very ruckus crowd. TFC, TFC, TFC. Woo! Let's go! Excited soccer fans, maybe just a little. It feels good to be back here. You know, this is a neighborhood that's uh, been through a lot with, uh, you know, the bars closing down. So we're going to make sure we buy as many drinks as possible. Only no TFC can wrong. bring that energy. 2 TFC, nothing victory tonight. TFC. I called it right now. Nearly 15,000 fans packed into BMO Field. That's more than double the attendance of Saturday's match. And people came from all over. Where did you train in from? Uh, Woodstock. Hamilton. You know, it's good to see that, you know, people can finally get out with their friends and, you know, not just uh, not just in a basement somewhere. Because this is the first time back in Toronto for a long time, but really excited to just see, feel the, the thunder in the stadium and the excitement. Metrolinx increased GO train service to accommodate the crowds. There were long waits and lineups to get into nearby bars and restaurants. Many were at capacity. No better feeling, man. It's great to feel like we're getting back into the swing of things. Obviously, we still got to space everybody out. We still got to follow all the rules. But even just to have this just feels like we're getting closer and closer to being back to full steam, you know? More fans coming down to the game combined with indoor dining now allowed meant all 200 seats at Brazen Head and Black Sheep were full today. It changes the energy of the whole neighborhood. You can feel it. You can feel the crowd getting excited. It was the largest gathering at a sporting event in Toronto since March 2020. Toronto FC have 11 home games remaining this season. The Toronto Blue Jays will see 15,000 fans of their own when they play their first home game at the Rogers Centre on July 30th. Now, Kelda, so many of the people I spoke to today were so happy that things are starting to resemble pre-pandemic life, and they hope that it stays that way. We know that Toronto FC has 11 home games remaining this season, and that's going to be show out for the rest of the year, and hopefully that's going to bring more business back here to Liberty Village. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much, Dale. That's our Dale Manuk Doug live for us in Liberty Village tonight. You got it. Demonstrators gathered outside the police station tonight at 14 Division to demand the release of over 20 people who were arrested earlier today at Lamport Stadium. You can see a large crowd gathered outside the station. Riot police were on site and the encampment support network. Toronto claims some people were pepper sprayed. The police meanwhile say the crowd was hostile and demonstrators were throwing soup cans and frozen bottles. At least one officer was injured. Police say officers can use a number of lawful tactics in order to protect themselves and keep crowds under control. And pepper spray is one of them. Three people were arrested and you can see several vehicles behind the police station were damaged. Earlier today, another dramatic scene played out at Lamport Stadium. 26 people were arrested after scuffles broke out between police and demonstrators as officers tried to clear a homeless encampment there. Our Greg Ross takes us through what happened. Another violent clash between police and residents of a homeless encampment, this time at Lamport Stadium. 
It started early in the morning when police and city staff moved in. They surrounded the encampment with fencing and began telling people living there they had to leave. We want people to leave this park. And if people do not leave this park, then the police officers will take people away from this park. Some agreed to accept housing offered by the city. That's the plan to keep us in this hotel. There's a song called I Fought the Law and the Law Won, and I live by it. You don't fight the law because then you lose. Most were defiant. This got to stop. We're not harming nobody. We're not troubling nobody. They really got to leave us alone. We are the victims. We are the vulnerable ones, and we're getting attacked by the government. At around 1 p.m., a crowd of protesters had gathered outside the fence. Inside, city staff notified residents they were clearing the camp. Hello? Moments later, protesters tried to force their way through the fence, clashing with police and security. Several protesters were arrested as a mounted unit was brought in to disperse the crowd. Inside the fence, residents and protesters began setting up barricades of their own as a police line moved in. Several people were taken away in cuffs by police. One officer and one security guard suffered minor injuries in the melee. It was sprayed with something that had to go and get some medical attention to clean their eyes. I don't know if it was a, some sort of a pepper spray, a hairspray, I don't know what it was. But. It took the police less than half an hour to clear the encampment. They say the park is now back in the hands of city staff and they expect to have it closed off for some time. So I understand that there's a reconditioning of the public space that has to happen and unfortunately that doesn't happen overnight. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. One person is dead and three people are injured after a crash in Etobicoke tonight. Emergency crews were called to Highway 27 and Eglinton Avenue West just after 7.30 for reports of a two-car collision. One person was pronounced dead at the scene. Another was rushed to hospital with serious injuries. Two other people suffered minor injuries. There's no further details on the cause of the crash. Highway 27 was closed for much of the evening. Toronto police are investigating after two people were found dead at a home in the city's northwest. Emergency crews were called to the scene near Dufferin and Eglinton just after 12.30 this afternoon. Police say the victims were located with obvious signs of trauma. Both were pronounced dead at the scene. Police are not releasing details of the victims' identities until next of kin has been notified. The family of Jamil Nazarali has identified him as the man killed earlier this week in what police say was a deliberate hit and run. Nazarali died after a man dri driving a pickup truck struck him in the area of Polson and Cherry Streets on Monday night. Police say it happened after an argument. 32-year-old Robert Kata is wanted for second-degree murder and attempted murder. Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, a much more comfortable day, a really nice break from the humidity and the hazy conditions of the past few days. Yeah, you aren't kidding, Kelda. Much more comfortable, right? Other than, you know, a little bit of a breeze, which I think many people were probably pretty happy to have out of the north northwest and not seeing those temperatures close to 30 degrees or humid x values around 36 instead hey look at what a normal high is for this time of year it's 27 and today we were below that 24.3 degrees and at times you could maybe add one or two onto that to get the feels like temperature we really didn't have to uh, contend with the humid x and also with the smoke because the air quality has improved behind that frontal boundary as we go into thursday we're we're going to see variable skies. What do I mean by that when I say that? At times more cloud cover. Look at this in the early morning hours. Then kind of midday, we'll see nice breaks, especially from the GTA back into southwestern Ontario, and then more cloud cover coming in. So it's that kind of mix. A few isolated spotty showers primarily to the east, so I'm not putting anything in the GTA and I am keeping us dry. Things will change a little bit for southwestern Ontario, though, for Friday. So we'll talk about that coming up tonight, though, 15 degrees, even cooler, just a little bit further north. And tomorrow afternoon, Kelda, a high of 26. Thanks, Colette. All of Toronto's mass vaccination clinics will start opening up to walk-ins tomorrow.
This is great news and it will help more people to get vaccinated. The hours will be the same from noon until 7 p.m. And so I encourage those who want to take advantage of these walk-in opportunities to come as early as they can. People can still book appointments at all nine sites. Tory also says recent vaccination efforts in low turnout parts of the city, such as Rexdale, have worked. Pop-up clinics across priority neighborhoods have seen a 35% increase in turnout over the last two weeks. Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown is asking the province to reassess some masking measures. I'm hopeful the province will look at the reopening of Ontario Act and amend the aspects of the act that still have in place the mandatory masking policy outdoors. The mayor said with the city in a good place, outdoor restrictions should be updated. He's asking the province to lift masking measures outdoors in areas like farmers markets and parks and sports fields. Brampton's chief medical officer of health also announced a Vax to School campaign today. It allows youth to skip to the front of the line to get their first or second dose. That campaign kicks off today in an effort to have students fully protected before the start of school. He said the city has a COVID positivity rate of 1.6%. A website listing businesses with vaccination policy for staff or customers has shut down after just one week. As Dan Takama reports, the creator says trolls targeted listed businesses and he was personally threatened. I think it's terrible that a small minority of very vocal, dangerous people are allowed to do these kinds of things. That's brewery owner Doug Appledorn. His business, the People's Pint Brewing Company near Kiel in St. Clair, was one of the locations on Safe To Do, a website offering a list of Ontario businesses with fully vaccinated staff or that required customers to show proof of vaccination. It had only been around for about a week. When it launched, we spoke to creator and lawyer Brandon Matalo about why he made the page. I know there's like some people who have children who haven't been vaccinated yet. Uh, some people who, for whatever medical reasons, can't get vaccinated yet. People have their own risk tolerances, so I just wanted to make a centralized uh, database for people to make their own decisions. Here's what the website looked like when it first went up, with dozens of businesses. But now the site has been taken down. Matalo tweeted that whenever he added a new business, they'd face hateful messages, fake reviews, and false bookings. The reaction was unexpected, he wrote, and said the site was only meant as a resource for people at high risk of COVID-19. Matalo says he personally received angry messages, including one that he reported to police, describing the message as personal, directed, and hateful. A North York dance studio, which was on Safe To Do, was one of the businesses to receive bad reviews, but its director of operations says he's just trying to focus on the positive responses. A, a few Google reviews, um, just, just one-star reviews, and I, and I mean, listen, I, I, I get it, right? Like, if people are frustrated on both sides, and they just want all this to end. Appledorn says his business was targeted too, but he wishes the site had stayed online. I thought it was really unfortunate that that the site was taken down by what are essentially bullies. A Toronto doctor says he's also disappointed by what happened to Safe To Do and that it shows the province and public health need to take action. We need to see more guidance about sort of vaccine verification. We, the honor system is not going to work. People having to make these decisions blind is not going to work either. The businesses say despite their experience, they don't regret being showcased on the site. Dan Takama, CBC News, Toronto. Celebrity businessman Kevin O'Leary testified over Zoom today from Los Angeles in his wife's careless boating trial. Linda O'Leary has pleaded not guilty to a charge of careless operation of a vessel under the Canada Shipping Act. It's in connection to an August 2019 crash on Lake Joseph, north of Toronto. Two people died and three others were injured. Tally Ricci reports. Kevin O'Leary testified today that he did not recall whether his wife Linda had any alcoholic drinks at the dinner party they attended the night of the crash. Did you observe her consume any alcohol at the Smith Cottage, the defense asked. I don't remember seeing her consume any alcohol, O'Leary said. An OPP officer previously testified that Linda registered an alert range blood alcohol level in a breath test shortly after the incident, but that Linda told her she had only had one drink and it was after the crash. Kevin O'Leary testified that his wife was the primary boater in the family. When questioned by the defense about boating protocols, he said she was meticulous and always made sure there were enough life jackets, gas, and ensured before going out at night that the lights were left on. 
O'Leary described the moment of the crash as chaotic and bizarre and said he didn't see the other boat until the impact, adding he initially didn't realize they hit a boat. There wasn't a pixel of light coming off that boat. You have to work very hard to make a boat that size be that dark, he told the court. He said about a minute after the crash, all their lights came on. It lit up like a Christmas tree. It was huge. In his cross-examination, the Crown highlighted inconsistencies between O'Leary's statement to police and his testimony in court, including O'Leary's initial statement to police that estimated the boat was traveling around 10 miles per hour. Today, O'Leary said it could have been going up to 20 miles per hour. Earlier this week, court reportedly heard from an OPP collision reconstructionist that the crash occurred due to the boat failing to have proper navigational lights in the dark. Today, the Crown pushed O'Leary on whether he was looking out for boats or objects without lights. O'Leary, appearing frustrated at times, maintained, this is not common. I wouldn't take a boat out at night without a light on. That's insane, he said. O'Leary's testimony is complete. The trial resumes tomorrow. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. If you work as a mechanic or electrician or in many other skilled trades in Ontario, the law says you must be certified. But CBC News has learned the province has not enforced that law ever since the Ford government took power three years ago. Our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has this exclusive story. Lou Troche has worked as a mechanic for three decades. He writes about cars in the Globe and Mail. He chronicles his rebuild of this 1978 Ferrari on YouTube. And he's pretty much seen it all in the auto service industry. All around me there are businesses that use unqualified staff. In Ontario, it's illegal to work as a mechanic without provincial certification. Same goes for 20 other skilled trades. If you as a consumer go in, you pay a premium dollar to have your car serviced, and then if you find out at the end of the day that what you had done, even though it may have been done perfectly correctly, if it was done by an unqualified uh, you know, unlicensed person, it kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth, doesn't it? The provincial agency that's supposed to verify credentials stopped checking three years ago, but continues charging tradespeople the fees. It irritates me. Yes, it certainly does. I play by the rules. I'm a stickler for my rules, and I would love everybody to be forced to play by the rules as well. Ontario's certification rules cover a range of skilled trades, including electricians, plumbers, crane operators, and hairstylists. The agency responsible is called the Ontario College of Trades. Even though it's legally mandated to make sure people are properly licensed to do their jobs, officials admit the college stopped doing enforcement the moment the Ford government took office. I think that uh, this is totally wrong-headed. Patrick Dillon leads a building trades union group. It's like having an environmental act with no enforcement. Before 2018, College of Trades inspectors visited thousands of job sites annually to check certifications. Premier Doug Ford promised to get rid of the agency in the last election campaign, criticizing the College of Trades as needless red tape. His government plans to replace it with a new agency next year. I can assure uh, everyone out there uh, working in the trades that will ensure that uh, enforcement uh, is, is present on uh, job sites. Ontario's inspectors used to catch some 4,000 people every year working in the licensed trades without authorization. Since the Ford government came to power, they've caught none. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Mostly clear tonight, uh, remaining clear overnight, a comfortable 20 degrees in downtown Toronto right now. Let's go back to Colette now for a look at your extended forecast. And Colette, these uh, comfortable temperatures will stick around tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. Yeah, we're kind of going to be seeing those skies really changing up through the day. So most of the cloud cover that's going to be moving in is going to be mid and higher levels. So still going to be, you know, all in all, a pretty nice day. And by the afternoon, the winds will shift to the southwest. So see the daytime highs from today? Let's pick those up a degree or two. So uh, for Toronto, you can add a few on. Now for the humidity, it's still going to be pretty comfortable for us. That, that'll change towards the end of the weekend. The outlook, we see some of those clouds coming in for the early part of the day, and then we get into more clear sunshine and then a few more clouds coming back with a few isolated and I do mean really spotty showers possible and primarily that would be into eastern Ontario so we're not really seeing that so much 
But Friday, a different story for southwestern Ontario. You'll see a few scattered showers moving in, more cloud cover here as well. It's like a tale of two cities between what will be happening in Windsor and Toronto into clear conditions. Those will stretch all the way towards Ottawa. So really looking there like a very nice day through Friday. And then into the weekend, let me show you the five-day forecast in a minute. We'll show you what's happening there tonight. Look at these lows. Okay, they're not single digits, but getting pretty close there, Sarnia and London. Tomorrow, though, yeah, a nice day. And again, you see some cloud cover here, but a lot of this kind of being at levels that are still going to let the sun coming through. Tonight around the GTA, Markham, um, through even Oshawa, I've got 12 degrees for you for the forecast low. Even Hamilton, 13. So, yeah, taking it down a little bit. Very comfortable for sleeping and not where, you know, we've been seeing things with some of the humidity the last few days. Tomorrow afternoon, there you go, a pleasant day. Still that northwesterly breeze, albeit light in the morning, and then and the wind should turn a little more towards the southwest there to kick those numbers up a bit. Speaking of kicking them up, Friday up to 27 degrees. Again, you're going to have more of that cloud cover in southwestern Ontario. But Saturday, I'm bringing some showers and thunderstorms into the forecast, especially for the second half of the day, so your morning may be drier. Uh, we'll be watching that, though, for some active weather and severe weather in there as well hopefully drying into Sunday, but humidity going up, temperature going up as well, and that'll carry Kelda into Monday as well. So those sticky conditions are going to be back, so you got to enjoy uh, this drier air that's in place while we have it. Thanks.